Filippo Grandi, good to have you on the Newsmakers. Thanks so much for joining us. When people look at the situation of Afghan refugees, do they underestimate the scale, the magnitude of the issue and the problem? Well, we are here in Islamabad to observe the 40th anniversary of the first exodus of Afghan refugees from Afghanistan. This was following the Soviet invasion of 1979. Millions came out of the country during those years. And uh, millions have gone back, but uh, as many continue to be hosted by Iran and Pakistan in particular. So it is still one of the large refugee crises of our contemporary world. And uh, because so many other crises have occurred in between, there is a tendency to think that this one has gone away. It's still there, it still needs a solution, and the people affected still need support, and the countries hosting refugees in particular need more support. So 1979, you have a Soviet invasion. After that, Mujahideen. After that, Taliban. After that, the US invasion and its aftermath, right? Still no political settlement. Yes, they're talking in Doha and they're talking elsewhere. War continues to rage. There's no peace, there's no settlement. Do you feel disheartened that there's a ceiling in terms of what you can do? You've been involved in dealing with Afghan refugees for a long, long time. Ultimately, there's no political settlement. This is going to continue to create refugees no matter what you do. You know, in my job, dealing with the consequences, the human consequences of uh, failed politics, there is one thing that I cannot afford to be, and that's disheartened. I have to always try, my colleagues and I, we always have to try to find a way forward, a solution. Sometimes the solution is good, there is a political settlement, a political agreement that paves the way for the return of refugees to their country. That's always the best solution. S most of the other times, this context doesn't materialize. And so we have to find new ways to help them while in exile, to find solutions for them, at least temporarily, while they cannot go back home. And this has been the challenge with Afghan refugees for a very long time. Afghan refugees are being told, you can go back home. You should go back home. Is that wrong? Is that unfair? Well, uh, one also has to be nuanced in that respect. If you look at this long history that you were referring to, 40 years, there's been at least two moments when Afghan refugees went back. One was 92, after the withdrawal of the Soviet troops. Another time was 2002, after the fall of the Taliban government. And uh, there were moments of hope moments of uh, uh, prospects of stability, and they were immediately filled by people saying, I want to go back. I was in Kabul in 2002. I was actually the head of UNHCR in Kabul, and we were almost taken by surprise by the number of people every day, in tens of thousands every day, uh, boarding trucks and going back to their homes under very difficult circumstances, under very fragile circumstances, voting with their feet for their future in their country. Now, these things happen. The question is, both times, 92 and 2002, their expectations were not fully met. And uh, uh, conflict resumed in different forms, in different uh, ways. And uh, unfortunately, these movements ended there. In fact, some people went out of the country after that. So it is very important that when these moments happen, which are political in nature, military in nature, they are immediately su supported and sustained by adequate intervention by the international community to stabilize peace agreements and give a future to people who want to go back. But again, it's the politics. Countries don't want them. Right? So we look at it objectively on the ground. Yes, there's hope that there'll be a peace deal. The United States has dropped more bombs in the past year than ever before in Afghanistan. There have been more civilian deaths in the past year than since 2001. The Taliban killing people, the, the US and its allies and the Afghan government killing civilians as well. It's not safe. And yet you have people from Sweden to the Netherlands to 
Turkey to Germany and so on, Afghans who are applying for asylum and having their asylum claims rejected. They're being pushed back into the fire. Um, I want to just go back to your first statement. Right. Uh, nobody wants them. This is not true. This country, Pakistan, has hosted them for 40 years. Iran has hosted millions for 40 years. So there is, in this region, strong sense of uh, hospitality. There's been ups and downs. There's been more difficult moments uh, in both countries, more pressures for people to go back. But by and large, those countries have stayed the course and have hosted millions. Uh, the examples you're giving refer, regrettably, to richer countries with more resources that uh, because, not of the Afghans, but because of other dynamics that we know very well, uh, the use of uh, migration or of migrants and refugees as a kind of political scapegoat to gain consensus by certain politicians. The hype around this issue has resulted in tighter asylum policies. Now, we know that. We're trying to address it. Our advice to all countries, in fact, receiving asylum requests from Afghans is to be extremely prudent in making those decisions that are about life and death. Before deciding that an Afghan is, who, has, who seeks asylum is not a refugee and therefore can be deported to his or her country, they have to think long and hard because the situation in Afghanistan as it is now is still very fragile. And you could expose people to great danger by sending them back. So when we look at these rich countries that you speak of, Maybe Greece is not as rich as it used to be, but it's considered a, a country that people want to get into in Europe as a first port of entry. I've had discussions with Greek politicians and others who say that, well, it's hard enough and, and it's complicated enough for us to deal with Syrians, and now you want us to deal with, with Afghans. The country you come from, Italy, they've had a harsher, more xenophobic tone, at least from the politicians over the past few years. And again, for them, it almost seems to be, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of summarize the argument based on the multiple conversations I've had over the past few years. When you speak to Europeans in a populist age, in a nationalist age, they go, oh, well, if we are going to take anybody, given the current situation, we'll take Syrians. Because Syria is actively under war. But Afghanistan, there's some question marks over it. The Afghans are seen as a sort of second tier. Is it hard for you to make that that argument that Afghans are also people who are desperate and who um, many of them don't have a choice when they leave their homes? You know, um, in um, judging uh, asylum claims, one has to always be a little bit careful not to generalize, not to say all people from this country should be considered refugees, all asylum seekers from this country should not be. A lot, many times, it depends on individual situations. Europe, in particular because you're talking about Europe, has a very sophisticated adjudication system, asylum system. And we're asking them to use it properly, more efficiently. We've made many suggestions how to do that. But to err, if anything, in the case of the Afghans, on the side of caution because of the situation that I have described now. There may be some cases that uh, do not qualify as refugees. We believe that the majority probably do. You know, it also depends very much on which country has to judge. Uh, acceptance rates vary, but in some countries they're still fairly high in respect of Afghans, in others are not high. But again, I think that has, you know, the system exists to make a sound judgment on whether somebody is a refugee or not. We're asking that it is applied to Afghans without prejudice as it is applied to other countries that seem more obvious. But we certainly discourage the notion that one has to pick and choose which refugees to take in from which country. This is, should not be the fundamental way of making judgment. What's the end game? What's the ultimate goal? That Afghanistan is peaceful enough so that people have the choice to go back home or that they should go back home? I think your former point is how I would see it. At least ideally, it should be like that. 
It should be, let's create, let's help Afghans, because it is their process in the end. Let's help Afghans create conditions in their country that allow people to make that decision. I am convinced that if uh, those conditions evolve in that direction, and this is a multifaceted process. It is political. It is uh, security, very much security. It is also developmental infrastructure. You, you have to act on a variety of tracks to reach those conditions. I think that if, if the country moves back in that direction, uh, there will be many refugees opting for return. Others may not do so, not quickly or not at all, and we will have to then find solutions for them as well. Now, it's very interesting that uh, in this country, in Pakistan, in Iran, for those that are not registered as refugees, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of Afghans that are living in these two countries that are not registered as refugees. Uh, there is a process of uh, um, registration for them as well, or there was a process, and of issuance of passports so that and visas so that they can make, become regular migrants. Afghanistan will continue to be a country in need of remittances, is in that need getting, of migration. Is that and that's a solution. Now? Is that getting better Well, now? Uh, you know, this, uh, this track, this migration track, for some Afghans at least, uh, could not even be discussed some years back. Now it's a discussion. It's actually a process. So this is another track for solution. But for that as well, you need stability in the region so that migration, as has been for centuries in this part of the world, becomes a normal economic dynamic. Because, I mean, for example, the Palestinians have heard it for, for a long, long time as well. They're told in some neighboring Arab states, they're told, well, we can't give you your full rights because your dream should be Palestine and to go back home and to have your own state and so on. So they, they're caught in this limbo where they don't have proper rights wherever they are and they don't have a solution to returning to their homelands or peace and justice, right? So when it comes to, say, Pakistan and Iran as well, can they do more? Can they do better in, in giving the Afghans more rights on the ground, which is a separate track to what is going on in yeah. Afghanistan? I think you... Um with all due respect, and I understand your argument, but you can't really compare with Tell Palestine, which has a completely different political dynamic. Afghanistan is a state. But this idea that, OK, well, it will be resolved, so we don't no, have no. to give you anything. I, I understand. Yes. I understand. I think that uh, if you look at the evolution mm. of uh, refugee hospitality, the way refugees are hosted in Iran and Pakistan in the past 20 years, um, it seems counterintuitive because you go and see, you think people do not have rights. Enormous progress has been made. Mm. You know, uh, refugees go to school, to national schools, to private but also national schools. They can avail themselves of the health system. Um, uh, here in Pakistan, since a few months ago, they can have access to bank accounts. Right. So, you know, this, these are important steps. While the rich world goes in the opposite direction. Countries with less resources actually are making opening. Is that the full opening? Is that the full integration? No, we're not talking about that. But these are important steps to make their prolonged stay more sustainable. And I think this needs to be recognized. And this is why this conference is important. Filippo Grandi, pleasure having you on the Newsmakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Much Thank appreciated. You.